I'm I'm on it. So. Hi everybody, welcome to the uh, Chaos Common Work Group meeting. Um, good to have you here. So the question today is is if you know your current elevation, how high you are, then you can add that. Well, we just legalized stuff in Missouri, so <laughs> the whole population seems Love a lot higher than it used let to me, be. Let me. <laughs> <laughs> Let me add that. So the right now Omaha is winning. That's yeah, I mean, I, I didn't realize yeah. Omaha was that elevated, but I never gave it any thought whatsoever. We have at the western part of the state, we're at a mile high. Oh, I, so it, it just kind of—I did not know that. It slowly goes up as you head towards Wyoming and Colorado. So, so if you're, if you're doing one of those Iron Man things. You want to go from west to east in Nebraska. Right. It's all downhill here. that yeah. way. <laughs> I like right. to think that I'm winning because I am closest to sea level. You are closest to sea, yeah. Depending on your perspective. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm surprised, Don, that you're that far above sea level, being as close as you are to London. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. So it's pretty hilly where I am. Yeah. <clears throat> well, you have those cliffs that like start start you out. You know what I mean? Ah, like, uh, yeah. They just shoot up right away, so you're immediately at like 550 feet or something like that. <laughs> Not even doing anything. Yeah. All right. Does does actually does does England or the the UK does it have much coastline that goes right into or is it a real cliffy or is it highly variable? It's a giant amount of coastline. So I guess yeah, it's, it's a giant amount of coastline. So it's it's pretty variable. We suspect there are there are loads of cliffs. You're absolutely right. And but there are also like if you go to places like Brighton, there's loads of like rocky beaches. Okay, where the ground goes right into the ocean. Yep. All right. Well, great. Uh, it's good to have you here. A couple things on the agenda for today. Um, so thanks to Don for putting together um, some approaches towards chaos governance. And so if you'd like to take a look um, at that document here, yeah. it's now starting to kind of make the rounds. So uh, Don, do you want to speak to this at all? You kind of. Um, yeah. So, so what I've, what I've tried to do is, um, well, I guess just to back up, like the chaos project has evolved a lot since it was first started, and we haven't really changed our governance structure since then. And we've added, we've added loads of working groups, and now we're talking about adding different kinds of working groups. We've got software, we have chapters, we have all this stuff going on, and I felt like there wasn't a really clear definition of how all of these things kind of come together and who's responsible for what. Um, so I, so this is really kind of. Um, taking a shot at defining what we have now and um, the way that we think it's going to work moving forward with the idea that we should keep this as simple as possible um, because changes to governance will require governance board approval. So what we don't want is things in here that are going to change all the time. So like the working group names and things like that will pull out of this document and into a team's document, for example. Um, but this is the way it looks right now. We've got three different kinds of working groups. We've got the, the two software sub projects, and um, then we have the geographical chapters. And I added this bit about, you know, feedback loops of participation um, with the governing board providing kind of the overall oversight into the project. Um, and that, that graphic is something that someone with some graphics skills should replace for me. Um, because that's, that's not, it's not very pretty, but, um, but I wanted something there so that people can kind of get the big picture. Um, and if we think that's right, then we can have somebody do some prettifying of, of my little silly chart. <laughs> oh, right. thanks Elizabeth. It's super simple. Um, but yeah, so, so this is kind of defines, defines the working groups, the three different kinds of working groups, the fact that each of them should have a chair, um, at least one chair. And then we have optional kind of new, um, well, a new role, which is liaisons and then maintainers as well. So those are kind of optional, but the idea would be that everything would have at least a chair so that some, you know, you have somebody to contact. So we'll under under working all groups, where you all of these working groups out of this document and into a, a teams or roles document, something like that. Under under working groups, where you've listed context, is is that the the science university and OSPO? Yep. Kinds of stuff, 
And yep. it, I think if I remember from some of our earlier discussions, you don't have those explicitly in there because when they change or be added, we have to change our governance document. So it's best to keep it more ambiguous in this document. It's, it's best to keep it higher level and um, focus on kind of what that group should be what those types of groups should be doing okay. so it's not it's not ambiguous it's it's um specific but it's not um oh i see we actually do list the context working groups down here uh, but i'm gonna pull that out that's that's okay. not going to be in the governance doc i see but the idea is that it just talks about what they're responsible for um and then there'll be a link to where you can get the current list and i'm but, like I'm we need person, to create that page. I'm the person under chaos community who just made a comment about um, changing one word, like the the liaising piece. I guess because I think I think it's the um, it's the context specific working groups specifically that we want to make sure there's a, a chaos liaison involved, like some someone. In, that knows chaos and then be, in, get, embeds themselves in the context of university science and OSPO to an extent where we can have that flow of metric and metric models and understanding the needs of those communities and translating those into new metrics or new metrics models and then software so that those groups see the like, yeah. live action of, of chaos liaising with them having value and, and I, I don't know if, if that, I think that may only apply to the context working groups directly, at least as I had thought about it, but maybe I'm thinking wrong or not understand. I was having, I was not clear exactly what we meant by liaison, but um, I'm, I'm more clear now. And I was. I thought, I thought it was, it was mainly aimed at these context specific working groups. Like there was not really a need for a liaison in the others because the people are also engaged in the chaos project. I'll stop. Talking. No, I, I think I think so. We should we should strive to have liaisons for all of the working groups. The reason it says may in here is because um, what we don't want to be is like if, if we're temporarily we don't have one I or we're between liaisons. Right. We, okay. we don't want to be in violation of our governance structure. Um, I'm checking that box off then. I get it. Yeah, Kevin has a question. So I, I'm sorry. So the we would have a liaison to the risk working group from chaos. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So the idea would be that um, we would have this new role, which is a, a liaison role. So each each working group would have one of these. So in the context of risk, um, you know, you might have a liaison that when you when you're working on defining a new metric, maybe they, um, you know, get in touch with the Augur project and the Grimoire Labs project and make sure that we we actually have some kind of a, maybe a file an issue for implementing it, or, um, you know, maybe interfacing with the OSPO working group, because maybe this new metric is something that would be really interesting to people who work in OSPOs. So, you know, maybe bringing that into, um, and, you know, mentioning it in the, the OSPO working group. So, so these people would, would really, be because we, we all get busy right but if you have a person who's responsible for thinking about the the stuff that you've just talked about and what other teams within the project need to need to be aware of it you know in particular things like the website the um communications groups i think these liaisons will help us uh better communicate what we do um keep keep things in sync so so like sean uh, when we've when we've talked about this in the past i was uh I think all of the discussions were really around the liaisons just uh, going to the context working groups. So the the way I had been kind of thinking about it was that the liaisons would be members of the metrics working groups uh, that work with the context working groups as as a liaison. Uh, so the so rather than common, for example, having a liaison, common would send a liaison to science. So that would be, but in order for that liaison to stay connected, they would have to also attend the common working group. So they'd be the common working group liaison, but then maybe they would also 
liaise with science, but we don't want to send, you know, we don't want to have like five liaisons in each one of them. Um, Cause you could easily get like sort of liaison proliferation. And then maybe Matt, this was, I got this kind of out of some of the stuff that you've done. Um, am I interpreting this the way that you intended it? Did yeah, it come from somewhere else? This is an interesting conversation. So the original, original intention was the liaison role simply here. Okay. So, and the reason was, was so that like folks in that OSPO working group don't need to understand the details of how chaos works and somebody could help. So like if, mm -hmm. as an example, um, like, you know, Claire, when she like wanted to do the um, thing after chaos con in Brussels, like she, the liaison could just bring that to the chaos con committee you know, like Claire doesn't have to, she doesn't have to worry about that. She just can say to the liaison, can you bring this to your people and, and yeah. we can sort it out. Um, and then kind of like what we're doing in the metrics model working group right now, like a lot of that discussion is coming from here, from OSPO mm -hmm. and the liaison's not official yet, but they're kind of like you, you know, like they're, they're us who are attending that OSPO working group and the metrics model working group. Yeah. So that was the original intention that said, this conversation um, actually reminds me of um, wherever it is, the conversation that I think, Kevin, you had kind of brought up, feels like maybe it was like a year or two ago, <laughs> as to how do we continue to ensure that we have coordination between the different working groups, because that can be a real challenge sometimes. And we've tried a different, a variety of different ways, which is like placing issues in the working group or just kind of talking about it in the community meeting, but none of those seem to work real well. You know, like one working group just places an issue in another working group. And then that first working group just kind of washes their hands and they're like, I did my job, <laughs> you know? Um, and that doesn't seem to work real well. So the a liaison from each working group is, is interesting because it might be able to help that just at a human level, like social engineering, Kind of thing. Um, social engineering sounds bad, but I know what you mean. Well, <laughs> social people, like yeah. having people be that point of contact. Um, I don't, I guess, and then listening to you talk, Don, like, I think we do need to think, uh, be careful about like liaison proliferation that we, <laughs> that we have a variety <laughs> of different people kind of like ships in the night, like one from common and one from metrics model and they're both kind of i don't know so i would i don't know how to sort that out quite yet yeah. and i think with with the way it's defined in this right now with the you know groups may have liaisons that gives us flexibility as to where we where we start those liaisons and see how well it works and then we can figure out which which groups really need them and maybe which ones which ones don't um, but I think the the other way to think about this is that, um, you know, this is another way for people to get engaged in the project in a deeper level. And so I think that these liaisons provide opportunities uh, for for people to move into areas of increasing responsibility um, and, you know, be able to do more and more within the project. So I think it's important to think about from both perspectives, like what, what do we need these people to do, but also thinking about it as a growth opportunity for community members. 100% agreed. 100%. And so when you say, do you have like a, in this document, is there something about like the expectations of a liaison? Um. Yeah, so that what I tried to do there is this this that first paragraph um, that they're liaising with other groups, providing input to the other groups as needed, um, and being able to keep keep things in sync and creating these these feedback loops between our working groups and the software projects. So, I mean, could we? Um... So, so let me let me uh, let me clarify something too. What I think we should actually have for each of these roles, in addition to just having this general description, is we should actually have role handbooks that are part of the website, part of the handbook process, and have detailed descriptions of the roles that we can then link to from, from this. So that um, you know, if we 
if the re if the liaisons end up doing something slightly different, then it's not it's not a big deal because what we have here is kind of a you know an overall description of of the expectations, and then um, you would you would link to more details. So so the whole the whole idea behind this governance document is you have enough that people can understand the expectations and and what what people need to do and what you know what types of working groups we have and so like the basic information that people need um, along with how the decisions are made so that's the other thing that's really important to have in this particular document so you know new liaisons are selected by the leaders of the group that they're representing for example um so so it's important to have like how how people get selected kind of general general description of what they do and what the overall requirements are to be be selected um and then um okay so this this makes sense and so what yeah. i'm thinking what if at a minimum at a minimum level let's assume that we wanted to have a liaison for every working group mm -hmm. you know that at a minimum level, the liaison would attend the working group to which mm -hmm. they are the liaison for. They would attend the community call at a minimum. Mm -hmm. And they would connect with other working groups ad hoc, like as needed for those points of connection. So there's really two meetings that we would ask them to attend common every time for example plus the community meeting and it's not that they have to give an update in the community meeting every time but they're there and if there is an update that needs to be brought forward it could at least be brought forward to everybody there yeah kevin you said common did you mean community well i meant like if they were a liaison for common they would naturally attend this meeting oh gotcha and then okay. they would also have to attend the the community meeting the okay, thing so, to keep in mind yeah. is when you when you specify that level of detail in the governance document, um, you are by the nature of the types of meetings that we have restricting this these roles to people in specific geographies. If you put specific meeting attendance, so I do have that for the chairs because the chairs do need to attend the meeting of, okay. of which they're responsible for. Um, liaisons probably should um, attend the meeting, but the community meeting is problematic because that really does restrict the liaisons to, um, you know, basically North America, you know, North and South America, Europe. Yep, and Africa to some yeah. degree. But we have, we do have recorded uh, videos or, and meetings, meetings. So the mm -hmm. liaison should really be current with the current discussion that is happening with the community. One thing that I just want to add is we should look at our community. Are we looking at this OSPOS, the science as a lo loosely coupled uh, group or are they a kind of coordinated group that would change the arrow, the dependency of the lesions? For example, if you see a good number of uh, projects and ecosystems that have, uh, have this uh, liaison things happening, if, for example, we have the common working group as the groups that the, the main group that will will serve as a coordinated group, then those working groups that are detached will have a lesson to understand and to report back. Because, for example, if we say uh, Don is the chair of the common and then she wants to coordinate one or two multiple groups. She cannot be there all the time. She cannot be at multiple places at the same time. So whatever they are doing, they should have somebody that relates with, uh, with the main group. Now, if we are going, let's say, to science, we should have someone who is more, not just interested, who understands that language, the lingo in that, that domain knowledge in that, in that space. Because if there is a discussion happening, transmitting it from one uh, meeting room to another, they can, it can really, uh, information theory will tell us it can corrupt. So not only the enthusiasm or belonging to the attending meeting, that other qualifying space should also be part of it. 
So we really need to dis to decide or to to make it clear what kind of couplings those uh, OSPO groups, the science groups should have with chaos. Then we'll see the liaison direction clearly in that way. Because the liaison is like an ambassador of that is representing whatever the state or the group or whatever. A liaison is a kind of ambassador. Kevin, you got your hand up. Wait, you're on mute, you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, so I guess, I guess, I, I think we're, we're overly complicating what, uh, what a liaison is. Uh, so when we, when we first started talking about it, the, the reason, the reason we wanted to have liaisons in those context groups is because those context groups aren't really in a situation where it's going to be easy for them to define metrics or to, to build models, which is the, the work that we do. So the, so the liaison is actually those individuals are, are there to help connect those context groups with the work that we're doing. Uh, so to the to the point I made earlier, it, it still makes the most sense to me to have connections between the, the, the working groups and the context groups as liaisons. Uh, and I, I don't know that like risk working group doesn't need a, a liaison uh, because the people that are in risk, they they know how to define metrics. They're they're part of the. They know how chaos works. Uh, I'm thinking maybe the the person. We also have this this other idea that's that's being added where we're reporting to community, and that's almost uh, that's almost a different thing. Uh, and I think the uh, the chair would actually be the, uh, the person best suited to report to community on what's happening. And then the, the liaison would be the, the best person to to really help coordinate work around metrics that need to be created around these discussions. Yeah, so I think um, I, I do think that we're we're starting to overcomplicate this. Um, I agree with Kevin that we should definitely start with the context working groups because that's the most clear um, place to have the liaisons. And then I think we'll quickly see whether or not we really need to have liaisons for other groups and we can see the value in it and then we can decide um, We can decide later. But I think also getting back to Matt's point, what I don't wanna specify in the governance document is um, specifically how they must do their work. So this is why when you look at the becoming a liaison section, if they, um, if they can participate in discussions, contributions, reviews, and meetings for a period of time, if they have that ability to collaborate with the team, if they understand how the working group actually conducts its work, then they can effectively um, perform this role regardless of which meetings they happen to attend. So I think it's more important to specify um, kind of what that person needs to demonstrate and having them demonstrate it over a period of three months gives us a feel for whether or not they can actually do the role in a way that makes sense for them and their time zone and their geography and their particular situation, I think. Yeah, uh, Kevin and Don, I think what you guys are using the word overcomplicated is simple. When something is complicated, it's because we don't articulate it to visualize it clearly. Like what I am advocating is that make it simple by describing it or make a kind of model that that complication around it should clear. For example, if we want to make a, any platform and we target a particular scenario, it is not flexible because if that thing changes, the whole system collapse. That's why I use the word loosely coupled. So we should first conceive whatever we want to do and make, for anything to appear simple, complicated work must have been done to truly reflect on it and keep it simple in that space for any users. For example, we are talking now that some groups knows how to define metrics and some other groups and things like that, but we were also looking at science at different OSPOs. How does those two dissimilar in entities fit into the same platform. That's where the, the complication now comes in. And we need to make it very simple by making a model 
that will not only sustain when Don is there, when Matt is there, when Sean is there, when any arbitrary person X is there, it will sustain that simplicity to my understanding. But if we make something that only a particular person or a structure that is right now understand it, it is not sustainable. So let's forget about that the complex or the smooth functioning of certain things and say, okay, let's say an X is happening here. What if this variable change will it still sustain? Will it work? Is it working now? Will it always work? If true, then it will work. So we can start with one, but let us see how that loosely coupling or how it will work will be. Because if we only focus about one group that is well structured, then the new groups that are coming in, what kind of coupling should it have? Because we need to make it clear so that if we are changing policy, it will not be as if we are completely rewriting or reinventing the wheels. So my point, I'm looking at it from that point of being sustainable for us to carry on. Even if we have to change, we will just be a, 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 a kind of evolutional process growing. Yeah. So I mean, it's just a way of saying when we are deliberating, we should not be using strong words like we are overcomplicating because it's part of conversation. We are bringing all ideas on the table. We deliberate and see which part to follow. It's an inclusive language, by the way. Thank you. Thanks, Armstrong. Yeah, thank Thanks, you. Armstrong. Um, so, okay, I mean, it's, I think actually the text doesn't change. <laughs> I think that, which is good. And to your point, Armstrong, and thanks, Kevin, and everybody on for this conversation, um, that we can start with the context working groups. Yes, with the liaisons. Mm -hmm. But it probably just makes sense to keep this here. I don't see any harm in that in you. I, I don't. What, what do you mean, keep it here? In the um, so the text that's written oh, right gotcha. here okay. not remove Sorry. it. Because of the May. I mean, and again, we'll just start. And and if to Don's point, like maybe we see that the software sub projects <laughs> would really benefit from a liaison. Yeah. And it's still a thing they might give us. Yeah. Or we could find that this whole concept of liaisons just backfires on us entirely, in which case, as a governing board, we can um, we can vote to remove this remove this role. So like so I think it's important to remember that none of this none of this is permanent. And it is it is to Armstrong's point, it's going to be a learning process. Right. So we're, we're going to figure some of this along, you know, as, as we go along, how how well it works and at what works and what doesn't. So the idea is to have this as kind of a you know, as a, as a starting point for what we think that we're going to need in a structure that we think is going to serve us hopefully for for a while. Um, but, it, you know, some of this may or may not may or may not work. The the context working groups may or may not work. The chapters may or may not work. Well, I think we'll learn a lot over the next next year or two. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we can we can always vote to amend this, change it, um, go in a different direction if we need to. I like this a lot. Yeah, Kevin. Yeah, I, I think it's really good work. Kevin. Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, I was going to, I agree with what Sean said. It's really good work. Uh, I do have one question about the, so currently the, the common working group is a metrics working group, but it is also a operations working group. Uh, is there a way to, either reflect that in the document or should we be thinking about separating out the uh, the, the the operations from the uh, from the metrics work I think it's okay to leave that in common for now and um, and see see how that works I think that um, where we can probably address that since we're going to pull the names of the working groups out of this document we can um, we can make a note that in um because that we have like a i forget elizabeth linked to it it's like a teams document or something roles something like that um and we can we can put a note under the common working group that it also handles some operational activities i think we can um make that a bit more clear so i think this oh yeah thank you matt 
I think this needs just, just needs a complete overhaul and we can restructure this um, according to the governance once we have kind of the um, approval on the governance document and uh, restructure this according to that and make it uh, a better format because this one's a little bit hard to read. I have a quick question about that. So um, this document, could we add, we can add teams without having to have them in the governance document. Is that right? Okay. Just yeah. I'm thinking of like, like sub projects or ad hoc projects that come up that we usually put on. Okay. Yeah, totally. And that that's part of the reason that we don't put these in the in the governance doc is because there there are always going to be new ones changes. I mean, if you look at what just in the last three months we've changed the you know the value working group to to OSPO, we've kind of rolled evolution into this working group. We've we've made a lot of working group changes over the last six months, and we do not want to vote on the governance doc every time we do that. No. And to Elizabeth's point, there's loads of like temporary stuff that pops up where people are working on something for a period of time and then disbanding. Yeah. And we can we can put it under the structure um, here without you know without any problem. We could call those you know we could put them under the operational working groups, for example, or or something like that. Yeah, I think like the project sure. badging group mm -hmm. and the project mm -hmm. badging design team, that kind of stuff. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, can, I really appreciate all the work you put into making this a useful and durable update to our governance document. And yeah, this is great. Keeping yeah. us out of the over specific territory that some people like me might have directed us toward. <laughs> would, uh, would you be all okay to bring this up in the community call also on Tuesday? Yeah. It's yeah. kind of starting. Yeah. I mean, I am. I will not be there on Tuesday okay. because I'll be at KubeCon. Yep, no, that's okay. But just. Um, but you know, just to start like yep. really circulating it with folks to get totally. feedback. You okay. in Canada? No, she's gonna be where's KubeCon? KubeCon is in Amsterdam. Oh, KubeCon, KubeCon. Oh, okay. I, I thought you yeah, said yeah. KubeCon. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. It's also, um, it's also on the agenda at the upcoming governance board meeting, which um we're working on setting a date for, but will not be at OSSNA because the time zones to get to involve Asia Pacific are pretty brutal for people who are in Vancouver. Yeah. Um, so and and to be honest, when it's when it's that split, there are maybe what less than half of us that I think are going to be at OSSNA or maybe yeah. about half. It yeah, kind that, of makes it a miserable experience for everybody to have yeah. some of us in person and some of us remote. So I think it's, you know, I think that the doing it in person at events and dialing people in works all right if it's like two or three people that need to call in. Yeah. But yeah, I, I'm a big fan of remote first. If you've got people that are gonna be remote, it's just a better experience, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think we had had so much success having the whole board at the community summit before the pandemic that um, mm -hmm. it was like a natural tendency to try to accomplish that. But Nicole and Elizabeth and I talked yesterday and abandoned that notion. Yeah. I proposed a date on the discourse channel and I'll send an email out about a potential 8 a.m. time the week after that and just sort of see what that conflicts with and when we can get everyone together in cool. May. Okay. Yeah, because it'd be great if we could vote on this. It'd be great if we could vote on this in the meeting. Yeah, it's the first thing on the agenda that we cool. started drafting. Okay. Um, so I wanted to talk, we've talked a little bit about our readme structure. So I, just so you know, too, for those that weren't in the DEI meeting, all the codes of conducts have been updated across all repositories. So thanks Don for providing that information and everything is, is straightened out. Now we had a variety of different codes of conduct <laughs> across the variety of different repositories. Um, but it's all, it's all squared away now. So we're, we're good there. So now, like that done, moving on to like thinking about readmes, and then I think we need to think about the contributing.md file, just in what that looks like. So just kind of one at a time. Just one, I can only kind of do one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. So the readme structure. Um, so at doing the codes of conduct, obviously the repositories are vastly different from one another, and the, the way that readmes are probably structured across them will vary. I don't think that we can have a standardized readme the way that we have a standardized code of conduct. And so this was the first readme just as a proposal to simplify things 
for the the metrics working groups and i'm going to be real honest even within the metrics working groups there's probably some variability based on that conversation that we just had between context working groups and operational working groups and metrics working groups so i'm not sure how to sort that out quite yet um, but this was kind of aimed at say for example dei um you know risk common these types of the metrics working groups so as right up here um some early participate um how to participate with the working group that was uh yeah i have, I have, I have two comments on this yeah. i would not list the time in us and utc because utc changes every six months when we change daylight savings because utc okay. does not move with daylight savings what do you so I would really put like whatever the canonical time zone is, I would put that and not convert it for people because that's that's where we create problems because nobody knows what the actual time zone is. This is where I've had problems with the Asia Pacific Fair meeting. Yep. It was on my calendar for the wrong time because I had it in the wrong time zone. So uh, we do and, need and then my other point, sorry, before uh my other point on the times is do we do we want to list the time of the meeting in every readme or do we want to link to the calendar? We can link to the calendar. I had thought that as well, which is yeah. a much easier way yeah. of doing it. Yeah, that much lower maintenance. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And then when we change the meeting time, we only have to change it in one place so we don't forget to do it somewhere. Math, just one yeah. little contribution. You know, as chaos is growing bigger, we are moving away from the perspective of a project to a more ecosystems. And then you will start to see differences within working group. So it might reflect in some areas. That's pretty much fine. But the common things will always be there, for example. That's some, fair. Yeah. And I yeah. tried to say too, like here, this is not meant to be an exact structure. <laughs> Yeah, more of a yeah. writing structure yeah. for the working groups, not like I mean, a metrics so, template, which is more of an exact structure yeah. that we need to follow. Unity is not always uniformity. It's yeah, diversity in in context. Code of conduct has to have a structure. Yeah, I think this one is just much more variable. Yeah. Um. So then a background, just a, a quick two to three sentence overview of the working group. Um, focus areas, if you recall, on a lot of the metrics working groups, we used to have a focus area table, and that was quite out of sync often with our spreadsheet. And so I, the suggestion here was to just link out to the spreadsheet. It is a modifiable document, so we are, you know, linking out to a document that can be <laughs> like changed by anyone that has the link because it is publicly accessible. Um, but at least it's a little bit more consistent. The released metrics from the group, it was just a link out to our released metrics, just generally out to the website. Um, new contributors, it's just a link out to the getting started page on chaos. So we don't, we just say go over there. Um, the maintainers is a list of approximately two people with GitHub profiles, if available, core contributors, another two people, if appropriate, with merge rights. Can we go um, back to maintainers? Can we change that to, to leadership and say, you know, list Maybe. chairs and chairs, maintainers, and other, okay. other people That's with roles, that. I think, something like that. We'll do this. Um, so like, like that. And that um you can i what what i would really like to see on this is the chair um and or chairs um and then maintainers are good too but not everybody has chairs maintainers and liaisons so if you just have them list all of the roles they don't necessarily need to be in separate categories it kind of depends on how how they want to do it Okay, so chairs wouldn't be optional, correct? Yeah. According to the governance document. Maybe yeah. Containers. Would this be optional? Yeah. And so this this actually needs to be. I should just go pull the. Do we have a definition of chairs here? Yeah, it's down in the roles section. Oh, 
try to shorten that up a little bit, but oops. There's something like that. And just pull it straight from the governance doc. No, I mean, I want the name of the chair for that working group listed there the same way you'd list the maintainers. Oh, yeah. So if I'm the chair of the OSPO working group, this would say Don Foster and link to Geeky Girl Don on GitHub. So list of just approximately two people. Well, it's it's um, one or more chairs is the way I would put it. Okay. And then they can just go to the roles. Yeah. If they want more information. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then maintainers or contributors. And oh, I heard you also say liaison. And so core contributors would be optional. Liaisons would also be optional. What's the difference between core contributors and maintainers? Well, for a while, I think I had kind of thought of the maintainers as the chairs. You know, that yeah. was always, when I looked at the readmes, that's always kind of seemed to be what it was, the folk people kind of leading it. Mm -hmm. is, then, it is it edit rights? Yeah. Maintainers? Yeah, so I, I don't think we have core contributors. I think we have maintainers. Okay. Um, because those are the people with merge rights. So, um, yeah. I'll just put this in here for now. That makes this consistent with the governance okay. document. Okay. And then one person. Okay. Oops. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, a license that is what it is. And it'll differ for different working groups just because things like Grimoire Lab are licensed differently. And then <laughs> this is actually what started this. <laughs> if you recall. <laughs> I do, I remember that conversation. So this prompted this whole review of README. So Don had provided a couple different suggestions that came from guidance from the LF. For a long time, we had had our copyright associated with a year. So we would always update it. And the guidance was just to stop doing that and just provide more general language around copyright. That's it. I like this. I think this is good. OK. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to probably Kind of take a look at each of those uh, metrics working groups like the ones that you have listed in the because i think it's applicable there and then what i'm going to start doing is taking a look at like maybe the operational working groups if they have repositories and seeing how well it fits there and if it doesn't then i'll just come back to y'all and tell, tell you what my problems were all right any other comments on this all right good thank you Thank you. Um, the, the, I just want to just a note, the chaosdei.md file is coming along. Um, could we, Elizabeth, do you have for inclusive leadership and newcomer experiences, the URL, the, the you know, numeric yes. identifier URL? I'll, yeah, I'll grab them real quick. Could you drop those in there? That was it for that. Okay, that was just a really small thing. And we really don't have a lot of time left. Um, but I was looking at the templates page in the knowledge base, and I'm proposing a few things here. Um, and I guess I will just say them in the three minutes that we have. So these are the templates. Let me make that a little bigger for folks. This is the page. I just took a screenshot of that page. And um, one of the, what what prompted this was do you remember this discussion when going to the metric model or the metric template that it, okay so that's i think i think it's great that we can just link out to the github the markdown because that's ultimately what people want the question i had for um for kevin or elizabeth is can, if can you this rectangle can you click that and go right to a github repo or do you have to go like to a page and then to a GitHub. A page. 
You do? Okay. So then in that case, the I think the, the suggestion was just to update the page that says the, the template is available here. So it's just a two link. Just, I was curious. Okay. Okay. Um, does that make sense to folks? So right now the template, if you click that, I come here and I go to templates. If I click it, it it's this, which is not what we all want. So what, what I'll propose is that I'll just issue a pull request that just is like, the, the markdown is available here. <laughs> like the markdown for the template is available here instead of all of this text. Is that okay with people? Yeah. Does that does yeah. that work though? Because right now that page is pulled from Markdown, right? It's pulled from the thing. So if you do a pull request, you would need to do a pull request on the page that has the Markdown now, uh, because that's agree. where this is pulled from. Yes. And so I you couldn't that. do that. You just create a new page. Just and, a and we and we'd connect to it there. Alternate yeah. alternatively, the the other thing we had discussed when we were doing this was. Uh, actually adding the adding that link to the github repo at the very top of the template mm -hmm. uh, if that was the case we could still we could still link to this template and just at the top there would just be a a link that would take you to github uh, that might be a little bit easier to manage on the community repo uh, and I think it would be a better experience for people because there are people who might want to just look at the template, in which case that page is just fine for them. Um, for those of us that work on metrics every day, like we want the we want the markdown. Um, so yeah, I think a link to the top would be at the top to the markdown file would be good. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll do that for just both. It's really just two: the metric model template and the metric template. Yeah. So um, yeah. let's put these on the agenda for next time. Just or we can continue just to talk async because we're out of time. And did you, Matt, did you also fix that code of conduct template? Um, because that was the other part that we started talking about with the... Um, oh, so it's like this, template. this code of conduct te template right here. Yeah. So I'm actually proposing we just remove that here. Okay, good. Yeah. Yep, so there are a couple. You can see proposed remove code of conduct template. Yeah, so okay. Oh yeah, I see that. Thank you. So just don't have time to go through all those, but, and then like the readme, like based on our discussions, like we can at least make that change a little bit too, like working group readmes or something like that. Yeah, anything we can standardize or centralize and yep. have to maintain once seems like a great idea to me. Okay, sounds good. It was a good discussion. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Good to see you all. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice day, everyone. All right, take care. Nice.